So today we're going to check out Altitude Hold and the upcoming release of Betaflight 4.6. So again, Altitude Hold is not in the current stable release of Betaflight 4.5, but it is in the development build of 4.6. We're going to compare that with INAD's Altitude Hold. INAV has had altitude hold for a long time, and we're going to check out how Betaflight performs versus INAV's altitude hold in a head-to-head -head comparison. But I first want to cover the elephant in the room. What does it matter if Betaflight's adding GPS navigation modes if INAV has them already, or ArduPilot for that matter? Well, the really important thing from my seat between INAV and Betaflight, the big difference is the filter performance that Betaflight offers and the PID performance. So generally, no other firmware provides the same amount of performance that Betaflight does in regard to filter performance, how well it can filter out vibrations and noise, and how well the PID controller works to keep the quad on the sticks, basically following your finger inputs, the least amount of latency through its just the implementation of feed forward and some of the other things that have really been tweaked out over the years in Betaflight. But touching back on that, the filter performance between iNav and Betaflight is very distinguishable. If you take a quad from Betaflight and put it on iNav, you are not gonna get the same strength of filters. Sure, iNav has low pass filters, the dynamic notch and the RPM filter, but there is differences in how well those filters work. Head to head, iNav's low pass filters basically are the same thing as Betaflight's low pass filters. Where the deviation starts coming into play is with the dynamic notch and the RPM filters. The dynamic notch in iNav is called the matrix filter, but in Betaflight it's just called the dynamic notch. And although both use notch filters, the peak detection in Betaflight is far superior than iNav. iNav is really running on the old dynamic notch code for how it is doing peak detection, and it's only detecting one peak. And then it can put, with the matrix filter, it can detect the peak on roll and put notches on roll, pitch, and yaw when it's in 3D mode for where the peak is on roll, and then do the same thing for pitch. It will detect the peak on pitch and put notches on roll, pitch, and yaw, same thing on yaw. So that's how you get the three by three, and that's why they call it the matrix filter. But that peak detection is old. We've noticed in beta flight, this is one of the things I actually contributed, is I noticed in beta flight years and years ago about how the dynamic notch was not really detecting peaks all that well, and it had a very narrow window that it would operate within. That kind of got a lot of people started out. I didn't make the code improvements myself, but I was kind of part of the hey, why doesn't this work right? And, you know, through the log analysis and, you know, why do I still have peaks that are, you know, above the 200 or 350 hertz range that really aren't getting tracked by the dynamic notch? A lot of people have done a lot of hard work on Betaflight's notch detection algorithms and improved all that. And now Betaflight can detect up to five peaks on each axis independently. So that's one piece of it. The RPM filter is another piece. Betaflight's RPM filters are using bi-directional D-shot data, which is very fast, where iNav's RPM filters are using the ESC telemetry RPM data, which is really slow, like one milliseconds to 20 milliseconds difference. Well, that makes all the difference in the world because by the time iNav, if you have a lot of big motor input and swings in RPM, like a racing quad or some dynamic moving uh, cine lifter, by the time iNav moves the notches to there, the peaks are already at a different location. Now, if you're just doing a cruising flight, iNav is fine. You know, big lumbering quads that aren't changing uh, RPM very fast and abruptly, then both the uh, dynamic notch and the RPMs in iNav work fine because those peaks aren't sliding or moving around. But if you have a lot of dynamic input behavior, uh, like a Cinelifter or some other big quad or some sort of racing quad or something like that, then yeah, it's, it's a little slow. So hopefully with that, we can understand why is it important that Betaflight's adding GPS modes? It's because you're combining GPS behavior with the performance that Betaflight has baked in. But before we get into how to set up altitude hold mode in Betaflight 4.6 and future releases, let's check out a comparison between the altitude holds in Betaflight and iNav on a head-to-head. -head. So checking them out side by side between Betaflight and iNav, I wanna draw your attention to the upper left-hand corner of Betaflight or to the middle of iNav. And we enter into altitude hold mode right there. 
you can see that Betaflight automatically puts you into angle mode, whereas iNav does not do that. You can still be in acro mode. Of course, you can also be in angle mode if you'd like by just using your modes in a, in a good way to have one switch, put them into both. But that's a fundamental difference between the two as of right now. And that could be fairly significant. It's, you know, a altitude hold is kind of nice when you can trigger it and then just for a long range cruise and just hold the altitude as you're, uh, you know, you can tilt the quad forward and kind of let it go and it will hold the same altitude and you can almost like a cruise mode for a lot some long range flights. The next thing we're going to look at is going back and forth here with the quads. And one major fundamental issue with altitude hold on, on quads, any quad, and any firmware, even both here you'll see, is that the barometer data throws things off. So as, you'll, as I go back and forth on both, you'll see that the quad dips down. So what's happening there is that air pressure is changing. It should be going down, I would guess, on the barometer. And that is causing the quad or the firmware to think that the quad is raising an altitude where it's really not. So then it pushes it down to the ground. And then once you stop moving, it detects that. The pressure, I would assume, builds up because it's lower altitude. And then it adjusts accordingly. So a big part of tuning altitude hold mode is a tuning for that bad data. And it's not a PID controller tune. It's really the sensor inputs tune between how much of the barometer data you're using versus how much of the GPS position, altitude position, and vertical velocity that the GPS unit can report as well. How much of a mix between those two that you're using. So that's sensor inputs are the biggest thing. And I'll iNav has, you know, great resources and traces and stuff that you can look at. And if you're interested in that, I have a Patreon video that's going to be looking at that more closely. And I already that I have a Patreon video that's, that looks at that in iNav. And we're going to be looking at that in beta flight here as well. So if you're interested, check out the link below for that. Now on this piece, we're just going to look simply at how quick uh, each of them raises by default. So you can see here, uh, iNav has about double the rate for an increased speed. Those are just parameters that you can adjust in Betaflight and iNav, kind of the climb and descent rate. But it's just important to know that Betaflight is, is kind of nice and smooth and slower, and iNav is a little bit quicker. So if you're interested in checking this out for yourself, you can do that right now. Betaflight 4.6, although it's in beta and development release, so you have to keep that in mind, is available to the public in general, and it's pretty easy to get up onto it and use it. Now, the first thing you'll need is you're going to have to use the web browser version of the Betaflight configurator. The old configurator will not support Betaflight 4.6. If you flash up to it with the old configurator, you can do that but it's not going to let you connect to it. So you will have to use the web app. It's app.betaflight.com. And you just type that into either Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge. Yeah, Edge and maybe another browser or so. Now, one thing you can do with this browser is if you want to switch over, there's a little button here that you, at least you'll see in Chrome that you can actually download the firmware so it's not like web-based it's actually on your computer and then you can just run it there direct so to do that you're going to look up here for a little link it will be like a little download and install link mine's already installed so i'm just going to shortcut to it directly and you can see with mine even when i hit the shortcut now i have to hit open here and then it will open the web app here and then at that point i can actually turn and close chrome you can see chrome's a separate application here so i can bring that up and close that out and now i'm directly in the beta flight app locally so if you you know people wonder about like taking it out to the field and stuff like that i'm not using the internet here although i'm going to need the internet anyways to uh, flash it but nevertheless then you can auto detect your board if you're not connected to it you might have to go up here to the top find my usb and then it will i'll bring up a dialogue here where you can hit connect and then from there you should be able to auto detect your board you will need to have show release candidates selected there, and then you have to change this first drop down down to development. And then from here, you should be able to click auto detect once that's connected up there and auto detect your board. And then you should see the Betaflight 4 or the 4.6.0 dev as a selection option. What I need to do on my flight controllers, I actually have to unplug it, hold down the DFU or the bootloader button, and then replug it back in to make it work. So I have this no reboot sequence selected here, and that's seems to be as related to this web browser, but you can try it either way. So by default, give it a shot where you're selecting, you know, with it. So it does do a reboot sequence and this would then kind of auto detect in DFU mode, but um, just be aware of that. 
Now, the next thing you need to look at is to make sure down here that the altitude hold mode is an option for that you're going to be loading in the custom build for your firmware. Also, GPS typically, uh, though you shouldn't need GPS. I haven't tried it without a GPS unit yet, although you shouldn't need GPS, but uh, maybe make sure both of those are on. And then um, you can turn off other stuff if it's, you know, if not going to fit on your flight controller or whatnot from that point in time. So, you know, obviously having out hold mode there is important. Pick any of the other selection options you need. That's normally should hopefully be normal at this point with Betaflight. And then we're gonna hit load firmware and then flash firmware to our flight controller. So after you get your flight controller set back up, one of the things you want to do is go into the modes tab and assign a switch to the altitude hold mode. And that will be the switch that you're gonna to trigger to enter into altitude hold. But before going out to check it out, you're going to want to go into the fail safe tab and then pay attention to this throttle hover point here. So you're going to want to have general gist of where your hover point is for your quad so that uh, when it's entering or exiting altitude hold mode, it's not jumping or descending rapidly on you. So that can just be a general gist and guess. A lot of times this is fairly close. And the 1275 that's in here by default is probably a little lower than what your quad hovers at, but it's a little safer that way. But pay attention to that. If you want it to be kind of more seamless without any jumps back and forth, you're going to want to put your hover point in here. And this really relates to like 27.5% throttle, right? And if you'd have in um, 1300, that would be about 30% throttle. So a lot of times I'm just looking at my sticks and like, yeah, I'm about 30, 35% throttle is where my hover point is. So that you'd put that in. So if it's like 35%, it'd be 1350 would be what you'd enter in here. To do that, you may need to trigger into GPS rescue, enter this value, save and reboot, and then you can come back and set this to either land or drop and then save and reboot again. So just keep that in mind. That that brings these values. You, right now, I can't change them here unless I have GPS rescue enabled. So obviously, if you're using GPS rescue, you'd have that enabled anyways. That's basically it. Pretty sweet and simple. Hopefully with that, you can check out altitude hold mode. Again, if you're interested more on tuning and some of the parameters in altitude hold, check out the link below to a Patreon video that talks about that in a little bit more depth and detail. We get into the CLI and there's, there's a PID controller for the altitude hold. It definitely works differently than iNav, which I also have a Patreon video on that as well, on how to tune that up for altitude hold. But yeah, check out those links if you want a little bit more depth on it. Thanks everybody. Hope this helps and I'll see you on the next one.